Welcome back to the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia. Today, we welcome Lynn Alden. She is the founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy. Lynn, great to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Lynn, you just published a book called Broken Money. We recommend that people go check it out. I want to start with this. Uh, it is a fantastic history of money overview, look to the future, diagnosis, everything about money uh, that I think somebody should know really summarized into a thick volume. And we appreciate your you writing this book. We want to get into the some of the sections a little bit more. But I would like to start with generally your conclusion about money being broken and Bitcoin being a potential solution for humanity. I've seen you, I've read your work, I've seen you transition to a more Bitcoin centric investment outlook and a research framework. How did Bitcoin come to the center of your outlook over the years? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it's because in the years prior to me being convinced that Bitcoin is working well, um, a lot of my focus was on describing problems. So describing here's a problem, here's how I'm going to invest around it, but I don't really have any sort of structural ideas on what to do about it. It's just a problem and it's going to be a problem for a long time, which um, a lot of people kind of fall into that trap. If you study macro enough, it, it starts to look very messy. And then if you see all these instabilities building up, um, I think a lot of people get kind of cynical. And um, what I found interesting about Bitcoin is that, you know, I, I have been following Bitcoin loosely ever since roughly it came out. I mean, you know, a year or two after it came out, I'd heard about it. I had liked the idea. I'd never been one of those like antagonist people towards Bitcoin. Um, but when you hear about like a new digital money, um, when you, you kind of place odds on what, what's the chance this thing's going to be actually a giant deal, uh, it's low. Um, but uh, after it's been around for 14 plus years, uh, it's been through multiple cycles, it's, it's had various technical challenges thrown at it, it's had various regulatory challenges at it. It's the only asset I know of that has um, declined in price by at least 75% on three separate occasions and came back to new all-time highs. Uh, most of the best stocks in the world managed to do that maybe once. Um, uh, and so it, it's, it's basically, it's got a resilience to it that I did not necessarily anticipate in the beginning. Uh, and so, you know, if you, if you just kind of keep running into it, you get interested in it. And for me, it's a potential solution to the set of problems that I analyze. So instead of always talking about the problems, I can now focus on solutions. And then secondarily, because my background is that blend of engineering and, and finance, um, the idea of merely trading around assets is, you know, there, there's a, there's a, that's an important market function, but it's not something that I necessarily find a lot of meaning in. Uh, I, I generally find meaning in either building things or educating. Uh, and I know you take education seriously too. That's, that's why you teach. Um, and I'm kind of a similar view. I either want to be, you know, taking knowledge that's known by only some and broadening it and, and giving my interpretation to make it clear, or I want to actively create help create something in, in some small way that was not there before and so i'm also involved in, in bitcoin venture um because you can i can take some of the, the engineering background or engineering management background and the, the kind of the financial background and help you know kind of in, in a tiny way help build some little piece that that helps make this kind of tapestry come together and so the the depth of participation and interest and impact that, that this whole space has, I, I think pretty ca pretty much well captivated me. But then I still pull myself back and say, I want to I want to be able to speak to both worlds. Um, that's something I've, I try to do from the beginning. And so I, I, I still focus on macro, um, but I, I think that it, it's, Bitcoin is such a Boolean outcome where if Bitcoin fails, that's, that's one kind of history path. And if Bitcoin is highly successful, that's a very different uh, history path, which includes macro. So I think actually a fundamental question in macro, especially long-term macro, not this year, but looking out 10, 15 years, one of the flowchart questions you have to answer near the beginning is, is Bitcoin like a multi-trillion dollar equivalent asset by that point, or is it stagnated or, or dead? Today's video is sponsored by River. We are extremely proud to be sponsored by River. It is a Bitcoin only exchange, somewhere you can go to get allocated. And we love River for a few reasons, but most importantly, 
River does not use a custodian that is an external party. It uses its own method of multi-signature cold storage so that you and your funds are not exposed to the world of counterparty risk. Now, River even encourages you to get your coins off of the exchange as soon as possible. And they also have Lightning Network capability so you can get those coins off like that. Make sure you check out river.com slash TBL. Yes, the Bitcoin's resilience is then the early trigger for you. It, you just keep, kept seeing it. And so as a proper analyst, at that point, you had to take it very seriously. Then you saw the optimism, the solutions to the problems that you were facing. And, and, then, it, and then it does come to the center. And what you're describing is this binary approach to analysis, which I think is important to enter is if you can reduce things to binary at the beginning, it can bring a lot of clarity. And so you're suggesting that the one of the first questions has to be, is Bitcoin a multi-trillion dollar asset in the future or not? Yes or no? And if it is, that means that it has changed the way that money is working a little bit. So you say that money is broken, right? <clears throat> How long can the dollar system continue to last in this broken state? Yeah. So in the book, um, you know, to some ways money has always been imperfect. Uh, you know, perfect money is a platonic ideal that's, that's always reached for, but never achieved. Um, the state that I consider money to be a broken is really in the telecom era. So basically, uh, ever since the invention and specifically the adoption of the telegraph. So it was invented in, 18, in the 1830s, but it wasn't really deployed in a cross-continent, cross-ocean way until the 1860s. And then it even took to the early 1900s to get, uh, you know, kind of worldwide across the Pacific and elsewhere. Uh, and ever since then, we've, uh, you know, obviously we've sped things up. We have other digital technologies, but we're in this telecom environment. So that, you know, you're talking a century, century and a half. Uh, and that's a period where transaction speeds and settlement speeds were completely divorced from each other in a way that had not previously been um, uh, the status quo. And that's kind of the period that I consider to be the modern era of finance and this kind of specific type of brokenness that I'm talking about, that, that basically there's such a mismatch that credit and abstraction becomes at the core of the system. Uh, and so basically, how long can something stay broken? In various ways, uh, the answer can be a century and a half or more, right? Um, and so uh, when we look forward, um, you know, I, th I think the dollar is going to be around in some f meaningful form for decades. Um, there, there are nonlinear aspects to this. So, you know, th there, there are things that could completely shorten that or things that could completely extend that, like whether or not you kind of reset the system and have a whole nother cycle ahead of you or, or not. And again, Part of it is did did Bitcoin succeed or not? Because, uh, you know, if if there's no alternative, then when something breaks, it can be reconstituted in a slightly altered form, and have a whole another fifty years, hundred years. Uh, or uh, if if Bitcoin exists and is functioning and is kind of you know unstoppable, uh, then maybe the dollar system fails sooner than than that. Um, but either way, I, I think that the dollar system is such a powerful large network effect uh depending on how you define it it's at least tens of trillions of dollars uh all the all the structures but on top of it i mean we're talking you know hundreds of trillions realistically um and that's that's a that's a ship that turns very very slowly uh it's not like an emerging market currency that can break in a year um that is that is a very um kind of powerful thing that i, I think is going to be here for for decades I, I think another question to ask is what what phase of breakage would the dollar kind of have almost like emerging market characteristics, like inflation that they can never quite get down to their target no matter what they do, because the overall kind of debt is so high that any sort of meaningful interest rates completely blow out the deficit. Uh, those those aspects, I think, could be sooner. I think we're seeing tastes of it at the moment, but I, that doesn't mean they can't get it necessarily under control in this cycle. Um, but I think that uh, we're, we're kind of in that earlier phase where some serious develop, developed market currencies behave in some ways like emerging market currencies around the margins. And I think that period could, could it could come and go. It could be a re recurring theme. And I think that's a longer phase before you get to any sort of failure modes with these major currencies.
It's a great segue to fiscal dominance. This is a question I've been waiting to discuss. I've been waiting to ask you. I would love to hear. First of all, I'd love to give the audience a summary of fiscal dominance. This is a concept that our readers at the Bitcoin layer are constantly reminding us as we get bo more bullish on treasuries in a view that rates are going to decline in a declining growth and in inflation environment over the next year or two. But people kept say keep saying, hey, what about the size of the deficit? It can, it can prevent rates from coming down. Give us a background. You have a great knowledge of the history of US debt to GDP and our fiscal history. Summarize this for us and explain us to us your uh, views on fiscal dominance. Yeah, so probably the short answer is that fiscal dominance is when the debt and or deficit um, at the sovereign layer are so large that they interfere with the central bank's monetary policy uh, in terms of uh, maintaining stable prices uh, as they define it. Uh, and what I mean by that is, so for example, if you look at the 1970s, you had an inflation problem. This was very, um, uh, a lot of it was credit driven. So even though there were fiscal deficits that were contributing to it, guns and butter program, uh, the, the majority of money creation was private sector bank lending. Uh, and that's large part because the baby boomers who had been born starting in the late 1940s were beginning to enter their home buying years, basically uh, household formation. That's kind of maximum uh, usage of credit uh, and credit creates broad money. Um, and so you, you had this kind of a period where there's a lot of bank lending, peak U.S. bank lending uh, at a time when we also had real world constraints. So oil, oil um, de production in the U.S. peaked in 1970 after like 100 years of rising and structurally rolled over all the way until the shale revolution. And so we became more reliant on Mideast uh, imports, which opened up geopolitical issues and, and constraints. And so you had both a, a kind of a more rapid period of money supply growth, and you had real world energy tightness. Uh, and that's a recipe for inflation. And so the central bank, uh, among other, there were geopolitical solutions to like get, those oil, get the oil flowing again and, and do all these other things. But the central bank solution was also jack up interest rates so much, create positive real rates uh, so that the foreign sector wants to own your, your dollars and your, your bonds, uh, and you slow down demand uh, and credit growth uh, and kind of get back to a balance there. And part of the reason they were able to do that is because the public sector had, they got down to like 30% debt to GDP. Uh, after multiple decades of bonds being a, pr a pretty bad investment on a real basis, uh, some of that was austerity, some of it was inflated away, but either way, they got down to a pretty low sovereign debt to GDP ratio. And so when the central bank rapidly increased interest rates, two things happened. One, it did blow out the deficit, uh, which ironically can be stimulatory and inflationary. Uh, but because the debt was pretty low and the private sector was the much bigger part of overall money creation, the dampening effect on the private sector far outweighed the, the public sector side. So it had two, two things that were happening simultaneously and the downward force on the private sector was bigger than the, ironically, the upward force on the public sector. The problem is, and that, so that's an, a period of monetary dominance. So fiscal was a, a factor, it always is, um, but the monetary aspect was the, the larger force uh, between the two. If you fast forward four decades uh, and you find yourself with 130% debt to GDP, then whenever you have an inflation problem, uh, either because credit's going through too quickly or there's a supply constraint, or in this case, largely because fiscal deficits are so large, right? So, someone's on the receiving side of these deficits. Um, and there's various nuances, like at any given time, are those deficits being monetized or not, uh, you know, things like that. But basically when, when the central bank encounters inflation in that, uh, very kind of high debt environment, if they sharply raise interest rates, those same two things happen. You blow out the deficit because of interest expense and you put downward pressure on the private sector. Uh, but now they're more balanced with each other. There's actually more money kind of tied to fiscal, like fiscal deficits are bigger than the amount of new loan creation every year. And now you're now you're blowing them out, ironically, by tightening monetary policy. And that force is, is roughly equivalent to the private sector. Now, that's complicated because different types of money have kind of different propensity to spend, 
right? If, if every if every working class person gets a six hundred dollar check, that's going to be spent a lot more quickly than if wealthy people get more interest in their brokerage account or money market account, right? There's certain types of of money that kind of hits the economy with higher velocity than others, but they're all a non-zero propensity to spend into the economy. And so right now we're when you when you start teetering on fiscal dominance is basically when a central bank tries to get inflation under control with their normal tools and the fiscal side is roughly matching it, ironically, because they're using their tools. Uh, now, if you go further than that into all out fiscal dominance, that's when you get to like Japan, where you get like, you know, over 200 percent at the GDP. And so the the interest expense from higher rates would ironically increase the money supply more like far more than any sort of bank lending you do. Like there's almost no loan creation to begin with. So raising rates doesn't do a lot for credit, uh, but it does blow out the deficit. So the point is, as you get more and more debt on the public sector, the normal central bank tools become less effective. And beyond a certain point, you kind of go through the looking glass where when the central bank tries to tighten, it can ironically be pro-inflationary at a certain point. That's We're not quite there yet, but we're kind of at the point where it's more balanced. So it becomes it becomes harder for a central bank to fight inflation. And, and the kind of the last point is when the deficits are so large and they're crowding things out, when they run into a fiscal, like a liquidity problem. So the treasury market in, in recent years has had a number of uh, liquidity periods where it became a problem. The gilt market ran into even bigger liquidity problem last year. And what happens is the central bank has to come in basically buy treasuries. Uh, this happened without much fanfare in the U.S. back in 2019 with the repo rate spike. Um, there were a number of us analyzing it at the time. They were basically, okay, it's starting the repo, but the Fed's most likely going to have to buy treasuries. And a month later, they were buying treasuries, even though it started as a repo problem. That's because in large part, there was a temporary T-bill oversupply problem, which is not the case right now, but back then it was. Um, and so the central bank can find itself at times having to expand its balance sheet, even if it doesn't particularly want to, in order to maintain liquidity in the sovereign bond market, even at times when you're above target inflation or having other things that would normally a central banker would not want to be expanding its balance sheet. So basically, it's, it's the loss of control, either temporarily and, and around the margins or at a more complete stage, like complete loss of, of control because the sovereign is is the one basically in the driver's seat. So I think the last way to describe it is that central banks tools are mainly about modulating private sector credit generation, uh, like either trying to accelerate it or slow it down. Uh, and they're not really designed to deal with a highly indebted and large fiscal deficit sovereign. That's just not really their, their tool set. So then let's relate that to quantitative tightening. They said it should be like watching paint dry. If we're in an ample reserves framework, ample reserves are only ample until they decline to the level in, uh, at which they're restrictive. Then you have a crisis. That was September 2019. They had to end QT1 abruptly. What's, what's going to happen with QT2? Is it just supposed to be the slow drawdown of reserves and someday we'll figure it out? RRP right now is the victim of QT, I would say, in that the balance there is declining. Reserves are not declining right now. Talk to us about QT. We're really interested in your outlook. How long can this balance sheet wind down go on? Um, once RRP goes to zero, will we see it shift to reserves? How do you see that playing out? Yeah, it's a good question. So up until the early 2023 banking kind of sub-crisis, uh, like mini-crisis, um, the the um, central bank balance sheet reduction, the QT, was coming largely out of reserves. Um, and they ran into, there was more than just a liquidity problem, but they, you know, if you look at what the treasury market was doing, uh, the treasury market ran into liquidity problems around the same time as the gilt market did in, in late 2022. Uh, that's when you started to see some treasury action. So the treasury started drawing down their treasury general account, which was began offsetting some of the QT. That kind of bought several more months. Um, and then uh, banks had problems in 2023 uh, that caused the Fed to, even though they continued QT, they, they also did various liquidity measures that for several months kind of offset their QT. Uh, 
Uh, so they were kind of like liquidity positive or li and then eventually liquidity neutral for a period of time before being negative liquidity. And then, as you point out, the reverse repo facility started really drawing down in large part because the Treasury purposely did that. They started issuing more short duration um, uh, treasuries. And one way to think about the reverse repo facility is that that is basically a pool of excess demand for T-bills. That that a lot most of that money would happily buy T bills. Uh, in fact, the larger the reason the Fed has that facility is to help ensure that T bill rates don't get pushed below their lower target for interest rates. Uh, and so, by having a reverse repo facility that is roughly at or slightly above their lower bound, uh, they basically are, is, is a, it's a release valve for any excess T bill demand. And so, the short answer is I think they can do QT as long as the Treasury is is maintaining relatively short duration. Uh, and as long as the reverse repo is is above zero and, and in the process of drawing down, that gives them time. After it gets zero, there's not nothing magical happens that day or that week. But now the the risk for accidents, the liquidity problems, uh, becomes much more elevated um, because there's no you're not really pulling money out of this like void back into the system anymore. At that point, if they continue to do QT. Uh, depending on, you know, assuming kind of flat treasury general account balances, you're, you're basically going to get declining reserves. Uh, and, you know, ample reserves is a challenging thing. I, and, and the Fed's even kind of admitted that they don't really know exactly where the line is between ample reserves or not. It's kind of like you, you, you find out when you hit it. Uh, and that's in large part, I would, and, and Caitlin Long and others have, have, I think, articulated this point well, that technology can even dictate what is, what is ample reserves. Because in a world where, a bank run was people going to the physical bank. Uh, that's different than like, you know, on your on your app at, at home or even software APIs, you can just pull your money out. Everybody can, like you, $40 billion just can be pulled out like in a second. And so I think overall kind of liquidity needs are higher now. There's obviously more regulatory things in place, not necessarily about reserves themselves, but about really safe capital uh, as part of the bank structure. Um, and so I think that, some weeks or months after the reverse repo facility is drained is when I would, that, that'd be my base expectation for when, if they keep doing QT, they're probably going to run into a liquidity problem and have to have a similar issue as the 2019 repo spike, where it doesn't mean some big catastrophe happens, but for financial market participants, it's like a really weird day. And then the Federal Reserve has to like kind of change the direction of their balance sheet. Uh, I, I think that's the kind of situation we could run into some weeks or months after um, reverse repo is, is fully drained. And I think a, another kind of signpost for fiscal dominance is that in recent months, the Treasury generally, the, the Treasury's quarterly uh, re refinancing um, statements uh, and actions have largely been bigger market movers than the Federal Reserve policy. And, and that's, that's uh, evidence and that's kind of an example of fiscal dominance where the, the treasury can ironically move markets as much or more than, than the central bank uh, can. Absolutely. We've seen their, both of the most recent quarterly refunding announcements have been enormous market movers. The one going into Q3 was a, an enormous mover in that it brought way more supply than anybody else thought to the market, especially in the longer end of the curve, it affected risk premium. Um, it, it it affected term premium. I'm sorry, term premium, which drove a sell off in bonds, a sell off in stocks, and then the Q4 announcement was smaller in that less treasuries would come to market, and ended up being supportive to all asset prices, and it is evidence that what is happening at the size of the deficit or at the margin of the deficit is market moving. What we, what remains to be seen and what we believe at the Bitcoin layer is that as growth and inflation expectations come down, rates will come down and monetary policy will also have to become more accommodative and the entire treasury curve will respond accordingly regardless of the fiscal situation. And there's just, there's no way to know. Uh, there's both sides here. And Lynn, we really value your analysis because it can, it continually just makes us think about the other side of the coin in that when we get into 
slow growth, we should just see rates collapse. Well, it doesn't, it's not a foregone conclusion. We'll continue to watch that. Uh, risk for accidents. I like that. We'll also continue to watch that as RRP falls down to zero, the risk for accidents increases in this ample reserves framework. Um, we'll continue to watch that. Lynn, there's so much I want to get into. Um, Lightning Network, I know you're invested in Lightning Network companies via your venture platform now. Um, I also want to get into the, the telecom analogy, but let's go back to the book for a second. You talk about the credit money system and you reference this in your in the section called the entropy of fiat ledgers. What does that mean? What is the entropy of fiat ledgers? And why did you choose that as the name for that section? So there's like a physics analogy there, uh, where if you have any sort of closed system, uh, the amount of entropy, which is kind of a, a scientific term for disorder, r roughly speaking, basically, he, you know, friction, heat, heat loss, just inefficiencies build up. Uh, and in a closed system, entropy can only get worse. Uh, uh, and in large part, what life is, is trying to reverse entropy, right? We, you know, we, we don't make our system less ent entropic, but we are, a, a life form basically makes itself more ordered and makes the environment around it a little bit more disordered. Um, and, but any, any sort of closed system can only get more disordered over time. And kind of a, a similar analogy is that in a, a centralized and human controlled ledger, uh, with debt and with uh, the ability to print money, um, disorder really only moves in one direction. It's not quite as rock solid as a physics uh, law, but it's pretty close in the sense that it's kind of like saying if you can manipulate the ledger, eventually you will manipulate the ledger. Another way of putting it is that if you have a, a long chain of leaders, it only takes one or two weak links every once in a while uh, to really kind of mess up that system and dilute people's savings uh, and, and cause problems. And so one of the low hanging fruits in the modern era is if, if any sort of nation runs into an, an issue, um, it's easier to print money for the difference and just kind of run large deficits and, and monetize them when needed rather than try to either increase taxes to solve the problem or um, you know kind of cut spending if you run into a problem. Uh, that, that dilutions the the in general, uh, the go-to. And, you know, before the modern era, debasement, I mean, debasement's been around for thousands of years, but it's inherently a slow process. You know, if, if I'm a ruler and you're, and you're holding 90% silver coins, and I want to issue 80% silver coins with the same amount of silver, I have to find a way to get your silver back in, into like my forges. So I have to either tax it or just kind of over time, pull that back in and then issue these diluted coins over time. And so it's it's a it's a tool that I can resort to to kind of subtly increase taxes without really doing it, but it's not quick. I can't just snap my fingers uh, and make it happen. Whereas in the fiat currency system, uh, you know, if you have your money in the bank and and we have like a budget problem, we can just do we can do huge monetize. We can just dilute people's savings uh, with a stroke of a pen overnight. And so the the ability to debase is a lot more accelerated in a fiat currency system. And there's really, there's almost no environment where you structurally get flat or downward prices um, because of good management. It, it either happens because of economic stagnation or just prices keep going up and the currency keeps getting diluted. And, and so it, it's kind of that human version of, of entropy where if, if you know, you, you literally can't print more gold, you literally can't print more Bitcoins. You know, with gold, you can only do it at, you know, whatever the speed of mining is, which is historically very slow. Even when gold goes up 10x, it's still like, you know, 2% a year, other than when you find like a new continent, like the gold rush. Um, but other than that, gold gold is printed very slowly. There's no amount of of mining that can make that otherwise. Same thing's true for, for Bitcoin. Whereas these centralized ledgers, it's always a release valve whenever there's a, a problem. That, that's why I described it as that. And when it comes to the current system this closed system they can just create more money and dilute it we're taught that credit is an essential function you speak about this you write about this in your book that credit money is thousands and thousands of years old assets and liabilities ledgers are thousands of years old credit 
it, it seems like credit is a natural part of human society and the creation of money through credit is also natural. So can a credit money system and a more Bitcoin centric system coexist? It's, it is what is now happening now, right? We have Bitcoin and we have a credit money system. Can that as Bitcoin rises over the future, can we still have a credit money system? And I know potentially some of your venture companies might be addressing this as well. So talk to us about that. So I think credit is is natural. It, it, basically, there's instance of it as far back as, as writing uh, is concerned. Um, and it's it's useful. You know, basically the ability to deploy capital in, in, in ways to accelerate something is, is useful. Um, I, I separate credit from fractional reserve banking because fractional reserve banking is an, a specific implementation of credit. Uh, it's a subset of credit, whereas credit is a broader thing. And so I think I think credit is good, inescapable, and always going to be around in some form. Uh, fractional reserve banking, on the other hand, is is based on basically a liquidity mismatch. It's telling one set, it's telling depositors that you can pull your money out anytime within banking hours on demand, uh, and then putting most of that into illiquid assets. Uh, and therefore hoping that no more than a few percent of those depositors ever want to do it. You're, you're, you're playing, playing a probability game. It's, it's unstable. And it's kind of like a game of musical chairs that as long as credit's flowing and as long as banks trust each other and as long as growth is happening and there's no major shocks to the system, that can last. But after some number of decades, it, it starts to blow up. And that's I, I kind of go back to the entropy. That's when usually the central bank devalues the currency or prints more money or otherwise stops like a downward, downward spiral in fractional reserve banking. I think that's that's something that as, um, especially when denominated in Bitcoin, that has much much more trouble surviving in a Bitcoin world because you, if you have an asset that's both scarce and fast, where you know no, no one can print more of it, um, it can be pulled out very quickly at the early sign of a problem, it's extremely risky to build you know, liquidity mismatch uh, on that. Uh, basically, credit is safer when it's backed up by capital of a similar duration uh, or more, which is that if I'm going to make two-year loans to someone, it should be either permanent capital, like my own capital, or I'm taking investor money with like a two-year lockup, maybe a, maybe a two-year certificate of deposit, and then deploying that into like you know one-year, two-year loans. Um, I, I think that kind of service is is just that that's useful structurally. That's kind of a, just a permanent part of the the economic condition. Um, whereas that fractional reserve banking, I think, is different. So in a, in a gold system, it worked because well, it worked till blew up because few people ever wanted to pull their gold out because of the just the, the clunkiness of it. And it works decently in a fiat system just because whenever there's a problem, you can kind of print more fiat. Um, so the problem gets kind of diluted over time. But if you have something that's as fast as fiat and scarcer than gold, um, that's that's a even that's a much riskier. Uh, uh, place to build a fractional reserve system. As for whether or not it could exist alongside it, um, you know, I think that over time that gets harder and harder because the the fiat system only works as long as people want to hold some of their meaningful cash balances in it. Otherwise, the velocity gets so significant and it gets so inflationary, where it's like a hot potato that nobody wants to hold any sort of meaningful value in. And so the the purchasing power market cap of that currency is very small. And so, and that makes it unstable to even lend in because if you're a lender, you know, if you, do you want to lend in like Argentine pesos? Probably not because other than like, you know, a, a week long loan or something, because you don't know, you, you can't make a five year loan in it because you don't know what you're going to get paid back in. Um, and so right now I think things exist. Like why, why does the, you know, why does the Turkish, why does the Turkish lira exist alongside the dollar? In large part, it's because there's, there's these borders around countries that that kind of prevent capital flows and kind of keep people as like a captive audience into their in their country's currency. Um, but over time, Bitcoin and then even to some extent things like stable coins, uh, any sort of like tokenized money basically makes the market of money uh, more fair, right? So instead of kind of being stuck in your silo, there's more global competition between what money is. And so in, in the near term, that means that, that the dollar can, for example, enter Argentina or enter Turkey or enter country XYZ 
uh, in greater amounts than it used to be able to because you can bypass their local banking system and you can go in you know over a smartphone over the internet and it can be it can trade peer to peer and it, you can bring it with infinite value density through an airport you know there's all manner of ways that that gets around these these silos um, over the long arc of and so that makes it that makes those systems harder to maintain in the face of basically a predator a stronger fiat currency uh, with with fewer defenses to 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 kind of blockade it uh, and over the long arc of time bitcoin could do to major currencies what major currencies currently do to minor currencies basically that if if bitcoin is around and it's a tr multi trillion dollar asset and it's uh, its volatility is diminished because 10 times more people hold it and it's just more li more liquid and like one billionaire can't move the price uh, and it's not like you know heavily used by like offshore casinos like it's actually it's more kind of distributed into the system. Uh, it, there's less and less of a reason why people would want to hold a meaningful amount of, of fiat currencies in, in that environment. Uh, and so the overall kind of, they can accelerate their velocity, right? But that's, that's a process uh, that's a long way off. And it comes down to how powerful their regulations are uh, in terms of restrictions they can place on Bitcoin and, and taxing it to make it kind of like inconvenient. And to do various things that kind of keep it at bay in a similar way that countries currently try to keep the dollar at bay from from their silos. So I think that's a, that's probably a, a, a very long process. Absolutely. Lynn making us do multi-decade mental exercises here as we go through <laughs> some of these questions. Lynn, um, there's there's something that you talked about with deposits, demand, demand deposits and the liquidity mismatch and the maturities of the asset side and the, uh, de, um, the liability side. But I want to bring back repo because this is something I teach all the time that maturities transformation these days is largely done through wholesale banking, which is, you know, is the repo market. We have all of this overnight capital funding 30 year projects through the repo market, bringing an enormous imbalance in capital markets and the size of the bond market even just through repo. So, you know, that's part of our thesis. Maybe you could talk about how you think about the repo markets from that side of things when you when you talk about liquidity mismatch and you talk about how it should be a similar duration, but it's not in fractional reserve and as a source of the imbalance. Because I don't think people, I think people understand this imbalance between depo demand deposits and a mortgage loan, but the repo market is the same thing in another form. So talk to us about how you think about that. Right. So the repo market and similar types of interbank lending are ways to kind of smooth over uh, these liquidity mismatches. Uh, and so, you know, if you just had a handful of banks and they didn't do, have any sort of connection with each other, uh, each one of those banks is now very vulnerable to liquidity problems, right? So if, if they were doing it with kind of duration matching, any demand deposits would be backed up by money in, in full reserve, whereas lending would be done by this more time-locked capital. Uh, and so they still would have solvency risk if they make bad loans, but they wouldn't have this type of liquidity mismatch risk. Um, but they do. And we live in a world where banks, banks, you know, if a bank's in trouble, they can borrow from another bank and say, look, we're solvent, but we have only, you know, 5% of uh, deposit uh, cash on hand, and we, we have 6% of people that want their money back right now. Uh, we're good for it, just not this week. Um, and so, you know, you can you can do interbank loans. And, and the, the reason why a bank might do that is because they're making a small profit by uh, lending to a solvent but Ill illiquid bank uh, to, to keep, you know. Um, and the problem with that system is that it can seize up. So you can almost separate pre pre global financial crisis and post global financial crisis. So pr pr prior to that, we had a very low reserve world. There's there's very minimal reserves in the system compared to deposits, and it, I, I think the musical chair analogy makes sense because basically you're you, you have a very little amount of base cash in the system compared to how much people think they have a claim to this base, but the base moves around so quickly that it's wherever people need it at the time, it's there. Uh, because banks are banks are like lending to each other and it's just it's a very smooth environment. The problem is when you kind of run out of rope there. Uh, in this case, you know, interest rates hit zero. De debt was very high. Uh, there had been a lot of bad loans made. Uh, so it wasn't clear which banks were, were solvent or not. And so banks were much more reticent to lend to other banks. 
And if you're liquidity constrained, even if you think you're solvent, but no bank will give you a loan, uh, you you can literally fail like overnight. Like you can fail that week. It, it can be disastrous. And the whole and then once that happens with a couple banks, it cascades. So what bank is going to lend another bank after they just they just saw you know this giant bank fail, or even a mid-sized bank fail, or even a cluster of smaller banks? Uh, and so it, it feeds on itself in a vicious cycle. Uh, and that's when you, you generally get the central bank or fiscal authority step in to offer, or usually a combination of both, to offer, you know, if basically the lender of last resort. If banks are not lending to each other, we will create more base money as needed and, and lend it and, and basically kind of keep that system going. So after the global financial crisis, in, you know, we entered a period of ample reserves. So basically, uh, a lot of reserves were created. A lot of assets that were less liquid were like higher duration were brought onto the central bank balance sheet, uh, replaced by reserves. Um, banks now have a higher threshold for where they would need to borrow from another bank uh, in, in a pinch, but there, there still is, is it's still happening. Uh, there's different types of, of lending. You can use you know any sort of safe collateral to, to get liquidity from that. And then the central bank also has standing facilities you know, repo, reverse repo to kind of increase the fungibility between different assets. So cash and a T-bill are already kind of close, but if you can kind of literally transform one into another, uh, they get even, they're almost the same now. Uh, and if you can even take longer duration assets in some cases and transform that into liquidity quickly, uh, you increase the fungibility between those. But again, it's a very centralized system because left to their own devices, banks at certain times might be more reticent to do that. Obviously, they can fully collateralize it. That's an option, but then you have to watch out for rehypothecation. You have to make sure that the same collateral is not pledged two or more times. Uh, and so, basically, it's it's a way to extend the system. It's it's why the system has existed as long as it has. Uh, that there's there's so many ways to kind of paper over these potential instabilities, uh, and even when they fail, that's when the central bank can come in. Um, so they're 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 a part of an efficient system, uh, but it's as long as you have an environment where just debt is structurally increasing uh, and there's a very large amount of claims for money compared to how much money's in the system, the whole system's kind of predicated on the idea that it never ends. It, it's basically, it's like, it's, it's stable this week, it's stable next month, it's stable next year. Uh, if it's ever briefly unstable, it can be made stable again. But it's it, at its core, it's this ongoing multi-decade, sometimes multi-century period of kind of game of musical chairs. And every once in a while, the central bank can just come in and add a couple more chairs to the system if it starts to actually end. Uh, and, and so I think that's that's kind of that, that's the environment that we're in. So let's give people closure here in your exploration of Bitcoin as a solution to problems. Why is Bitcoin the solution? Is it the best money ever created? What is it about Bitcoin? going forward that makes it the or a solution to this game of musical chairs? So I think it's, I mean, it's scarcer than gold and, and faster than fiat is, is the short answer. So if anyone ever tries to send an international wire transfer, um, you know, you're never really sure how quick it's going to be. It can be expensive. Uh, if you're going between currencies, it can be a mess. You, it can be opaque. You know, you don't even know the exact how, what bank hops this is going to go through. If it runs into a problem, it's hard even to say what what whose bank's fault is it because every, every other bank's going to blame every other bank. Um, and uh, so, you know, international money transfers uh, usually take a lot longer than ten minutes or or thirty minutes. Uh, whereas a Bitcoin, uh, you can you can do international transfers of arbitrary size. Uh, and depending on the size, how many confirmations you want to wait for, it could be ten minutes, could be it could be an hour. It's still fast uh, in terms of global settlement. Um, uh, and you know, there's there's faster ways like Lightning and other things for uh, smaller and more rapid transfers. Uh, you can do micropayments. Uh, you can have AI pay each other a fraction of a cent for like API calls and things like that. Things you can't really do with fiat given the overhead. So it's faster than fiat. Um, gold has historically structurally grown at 1.5% a year. It's hard to authenticate. Uh, so it's it's costly to transport. It's hard to authenticate. When Germany repatriated their gold from the U.S., uh, it was like a multi-year process, which is kind of comical. Um, and and so nobody really wants to withdraw it and verify it. Uh, and so that allows it to be easily rehypothecated. You know, ten people can have claims for gold for every ounce of gold, and that's like that's its own musical, uh, you know, uh, chair game. Uh, and it's it's because of gold's properties, it tends to last a while. 
Whereas Bitcoin, if there's ever a hint of a problem, you can you can pull it out and authenticate it within the hour. Um, and if you're blocked from doing that, that's a sign of a problem. Um, and so it, basically it's, it's, and like I said before, it's, it, it gets around these 160 different currency bubbles. So, you know, basically ports of entry have limited, you can only bring so much money through. You know, it's fine. Like I, if you're ever in an airport now and you see a sign that says, you know, you can't bring more than ten thousand dollars worth. If you're, if you know how Bitcoin or stable coins work, you're sitting there like, how do they know anyone in this line doesn't just have access to millions of dollars of stable coins or Bitcoin that they can just access or reconstitute by memorizing memorizing twelve words, right? It's just it makes these kind of gates obsolete. Um, and and so I think that basically is the fundamental question: Can Bitcoin remain? decentralized and secure. Uh, and if it can, uh, it continues to be a very powerful solution for a lot of things. Uh, and then the question is, when analyzing the risk profiles, like can anything derail it? Can anything kind of centralize and capture it? Can anything break it materially? Uh, even if they can't, can anything kind of set it back a decade? Maybe if the US just decides to really go after it, maybe they could set it back five, 10 years by damaging the price and liquidity enough that they really kind of make it hard for a while and give themselves time. Uh, but then again, they're, they're kind of bound by their own rule of law. We, we have some degree of legal decentralization and rule of law that makes that hard to do full stop. Um, and so I think Bitcoin is, is it kind of solves that speed to settlement gap that I've described as existing for about a century and a half. And it's the first kind of credible way uh, to do that. And it's, it's been successful for almost 15 years. Lynn, what about the Lightning Network? You mentioned it a couple times now. What are you looking forward from the Lightning Network over the next couple years, taking that next leap of adoption? I think a big component might be um, eCash. Um, uh, so there's been a kind of a controversy sometimes in the space of, of whether or not Lightning is good enough on its own if you're using it non-custodially. Uh, obviously, if you're in a pinch, it can be. Like if you're in an environment where custodians can't be trusted uh, and you're willing to do more frictions, uh, it can work. For a lot of people that want to pay very quickly, uh, custodial lightning works better, but then it obviously has its own, you know, kind of risks and, and problems. Ca like uh, eCash is interesting because it revives 40-year-old Chalmian Mint technology uh, that was always cool, but never really worked on the dollar system. And it applies it to, I think, a more appropriate base layer of Bitcoin. And it allows kind of these little full reserve community banks to be set up around the world uh, with very minimal overhead. And, you know, people can kind of join them uh, trustlessly, or more like permissionlessly, um, and you can spread out your risk. And so I generally separate Bitcoin as like a savings asset versus Bitcoin as a payment asset, right? Would I want to have my entire stack on a custodian? Absolutely not. But if I have like wallet money, right? Kind of like how I, you know, I wouldn't put my entire net worth in my wallet. Uh, because I could be mugged or lose it. Um, but I have an amount that's, you know, meaningful for spending, but not meaningful that if I lose it. Similarly for lightning, you know, if you have a, a small kind of uh, custodial thing, that's fine. Um, and the cool thing about cash uh, eCash, I mean, is that it's private. So it, it kind of gets around some of the custodian issues. Obviously in certain countries, it can have regulatory issues. Uh, but again, there's like 200 jurisdictions out there that it can, it can be helpful for. And so I think I think Lightning is powerful for connecting custodians together in a very efficient way, and then for people that need it, they can join it non-custodially as well, uh, which is a key important like that optionality of of using something in that kind of more cypherpunk way is always a really important part of the network. Um, and then it also kind of it, it can be like the interlink between multiple L2s, right? So you know now we're seeing Liquid, which historically did not get used heavily. Um, that's getting more tied into the Lightning Network over time. Um, and, you know, the cool thing about uh, eCash is already pretty tied into the Lightning Network kind of from start. That's where it might kind of help spur that a little bit. Uh, we can see in the future what other kind of L2s um, might develop, but Lightning is kind of like a glue that ties a lot of things together. It's, it's basically a sediment layer on top of a sediment layer that happens to be much faster. Um, and so I think that that is a, still a key part of, of Bitcoin's overall value proposition. Lynn, my last question, as an investment researcher, you're not one to make active trade recommendations. And so your framework is a much longer time horizon. What can you predict or what are you comfortable predicting about Bitcoin and its life cycle and its evolution 
as we stand today with obviously it not being investment advice and and nothing being uh, certain. What are you comfortable telling people, your readers, about the future? There's a bunch of renewed energy now, Bitcoin back above 40,000. People want to know the zoomed out view of Bitcoin. What are you comfortable telling people? So I've generally been, been suggesting that zero allocation is not the right number, that there's a really big range that can make sense. And zero is probably not that number. Uh, it's kind of my first point. Um, a second point I say is, you know, just learn about it. Like basically, it, it, 2023, you should know a decent amount about Bitcoin. Um, even if you're just trying to, you know, if you're a bank investor, you want to know, could this thing impact banks? If you're a gold investor, can this thing impact gold? Um, if you're a tech investor, how is this tech relevant for anything I might be building, right? So it, it's just something that as it, again, it's the, it's the first asset that I'm aware of that ever had 75, three 75% 75 plus drawdown, some of them much more severe than that, and recovered all new all-time highs. Um, and so if you're still writing it off, uh, you probably shouldn't. You probably should understand it. Uh, you, you probably should consider having a non-zero allocation. Um, I'm generally bullish with a two-year view. Uh, a couple of reasons for that is one, I think the ETF uh, news is probably beneficial for demand. Uh, the having is still material in terms of just overall kind of um, new supply flows. And three, Bitcoin is historically heavily tied to global liquidity. Um, and there's multiple ways to do that. You know, Michael Howe from Cross Border Capital focuses on that. So he's got a very sophisticated method of doing that. The, the more baseline one is just global broad money supply denominated in dollars. Uh, when that's going up or the rate of change is going up, normally Bitcoin's doing pretty well. Uh, if that's going down or being flat and therefore being negative in kind of year of year terms, normally Bitcoin is is not doing that great. Uh, we, we've gone through a pretty significant period of stagnation. I probably think that while I don't know what Bitcoin or liquidity is going to do in a six month period, uh, I think they're both probably going to be higher two years from now, along with those other factors we mentioned. So I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with that kind of um, time frame. And then longer than that, I, I think it's it's mainly a matter of is it having higher highs and higher lows? Uh, is the UX getting better than it was a year ago, three years ago, five years ago? Um, uh, you know, are is it solving problems for people? Uh, is the education around the asset getting better? Um, those types of more fundamental things are what I'm what I'm kind of analyzing. Uh, is the network more decentralized or less decentralized than it was five years ago? And if so, by what metrics? Is it is it mining centralization? Is it no decentralization? Um, is you know, one of the things that probably not covered enough is supply chain decentralization. Um, so if, is every chip coming out of one foundry or is there multiple foundries producing chips? Um, there's multiple ways to kind of measure security decentralization and adoption. And I think those are the metrics to probably focus on over a, a you know multi multi year time frame. Very based analysis. In the fundamentals of Bitcoin, it is a technology, it's a, net, it's a network protocol, and we have to focus on what it is to analyze its potential. Lynn Alden of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy, thank you so much for joining us. A very valuable conversation for the audience. Please tell people where they can find your research. Uh, so lindalden.com, they can check it out. I have a free newsletter people can join. I also have a low-cost research service uh, that might be useful for a lot of them. And then uh, Broken Money, check it out on Amazon or elsewhere um, if you're interested in, in learning about um, kind of my full thoughts on money, monetary technology, um, you know, the history of money. And then currently, Bitcoin, stablecoins, central bank, digital currencies, um, kind of the directions we're heading in. Wonderful. With Lynn Alden, I'm Nick Batia at the Bitcoin Layer. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Make sure you check out river.com slash TBL for all of your Bitcoin exchange needs. We love River and the way they operate. They use their own multi-signature cold storage solution so that your funds are not held on a third-party custodian's balance sheet. Thanks again for checking out the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia. We'll catch you next time.